Welcome to the Arts and Oddities Podcast with A.M. Hall, starring A.M. Hall. Now, here is A.M. Hall. Welcome to Art and Oddities with A.M. Hall, where I talk about anything that strikes my fancy to include all kinds of creative works from children's cartoons to underground zines to identity politics and everything in between. My guests and I will discuss how art impacts and reflects culture and counterculture, enables individualism and conformity, and have loads of fun along the way. I am your host, A.M. Hall, a.k.a. Anthony Bonafini, a.k.a. Galena Storm, a.k.a. Aquaises Mancuso. This episode, I tell you about what I do for a living and why I consider my podcast to be a form of political protest. Then I sit down with longtime friend of the show, E.W. Motomac, and we talk about cartoons and animation through the ages. So I have a day job. I am currently working in retail. It's not the most fun thing in the world, and it's it's very physically intense but you know it's it's my day job what are you gonna do it's hard for me to have time to do any actual work and by that I mean my artistic projects and it's hard to plan your days when you have a so-called flexible schedule which is the you know most horrific thing to happen to the working class um, in the last century, I think. It's important to understand your limits. Um, I actually had to be transferred to a different department because stocking shelves was exacerbating the tendonitis in my thumbs. On the other hand, limits can produce great works. Artists who have limited themselves to just one line have made incredible pieces. Other times, limitations can be an insurmountable barrier. If you're too busy working, how can you create the great work you were meant to create? Much can be said about how these obstacles are not accidents, but are in fact systemic barriers designed to keep the working class poor. Income inequality is a huge problem in the United States right now. I grew up firmly middle class, and I always thought that when I became an adult, I would be just as okay as my parents were but I'm not. And a lot of that does have to do with the choices that I made. I'm not going to forsake responsibility for my decisions. But looking back, I can see that it wasn't just me that made bad decisions. A lot of my choices weren't really choices at all. I didn't choose to struggle with my mental health. I didn't choose to crash the U.S. economy. So now, even though I grew up middle class, and I have a quality college education, I'm currently working class. And it sucks. There's not much I can do about it. Lately, I've been working my tail off, and I only have the energy to do so much. But I am so proud that I am so exhausted. I feel like the fact that I'm taking the last remaining energy that I have and putting it towards art, putting it towards the great work of my life, That is my way of sticking it to the man. It's a lot of work. And I want this to be my career. Unfortunately, as much as I'd like to be making money from my podcast and from my art, that just isn't the case right now. But the point is, if I can do this, I believe that you can do it too. Do your great work, even if it's just knitting scarves for your kids, or reviewing movies for YouTube or products for your community, or if it's volunteering at your church, you can do this. I believe in you. And if what I've said inspires you in any way, let me know, because I really do encourage all my listeners to give feedback. Email me at artoddiespodcast at gmail.com, or even better, post a message to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash oddartpodcast. And tell me whatever you've been doing to express yourself and to do your great work. And if you'd like to help me make this my career, you can leave a virtual tip in my jar at patreon.com slash panicbedlam. That's P-A-N-I-K-B-E-D-L-A-M. Every dollar counts, and Panic Bedlam and I are both 
ever so grateful because this is how we make art. One dollar at a time. Thank you. And please stay tuned for the rest of the show. Today, I am joined once again by E.W. Motomac. How are you doing today? Oh, doing fine. Now, you recently listened to one of my earlier podcasts, one that I had done with Evie about cartoons. Yes. And you had quite a lot to say about it, didn't you? Well, it only happens that around the time I was a uh, Dungeons and Dragons geek and a comic book geek, I kind of transitioned to an animation geek before becoming a uh, full-fledged film geek. This is all like maybe around the uh, late 80s or so, right when the so-called second animation renaissance was taking place on both TV and in the movies. Now, why was it a renaissance? Well, as you know, cartoons had pretty much stagnated, unfortunately, on both the big and the small screen throughout the 60s, and I personally feel they hit their nadir around the mid-70s or so, where the only real creativity was in independent animation, and on Sesame Street, actually. Describe a little bit about the stagnation that occurred. What was going on? Well, on one hand, it was a matter of budget. I mean, of course, film had become too expensive to uh, produce the ultra-realism of Disney. Even Disney wasn't able to do that anymore. And so Disney looked for uh, shortcuts, but especially when UPA pioneered the use of limited animation to break free from the realism of Disney, that was really when things took a turn, uh, initially for the better, but unfortunately it was co-opted by the uh, industry and became worse. As for budgetary reasons, we ended up in, as you know, a uh, something like an endless wasteland of low-budget cartoons with <laughs> next to nothing in ways of either plot or storyline or animation. I mean, you're most likely are familiar with legendary series such as Clutch Cargo. I have never heard of that. Ah, the, well, the best thing to do is to look at Pulp Fiction, uh, the scene where uh, in, the, in the flashback of the watch scene, young Butch is watching a terrible cartoon on TV. Oh, that totem pole, he alive! That was uh, Clutch Cargo. You, you, do, you, you keep talking about animation in a general sense. Can you give me some very specific examples? Because I don't really know what you're talking about. Okay, in the 60s, one of the more interesting examples of uh, how animation turned were the Marvel superheroes cartoons. The first cartoons of Iron Man, the Hulk, Thor, uh, all of which were essentially cutouts from the original Jack Kirby comics and just barely uh, animated enough to uh, move across the screen. On the other hand, of course, those had the uh, wonderful Marvel stories of the 60s, so they're definitely something of a uh, cult classic. And people still remember those. Then on the other hand, we moved into Hanna-Barbera's doldrums of the uh, 1970s, where Hanna-Barbera, they were subjected especially to censorship because cartoons were meant to be kids. And while they did make a few attempts at uh, so-called realism, or at least more adult themes, when we think of, say for instance, Johnny Quest, they were then forced to uh, cut back on violence in cartoons, and that's where they came up with a uh, genre that they pioneered in popularized with Scooby-Doo. Ah, Scooby-Doo. <laughs> yes, those uh, detective cartoons, Scooby-Doo and all of his uh, imitations, going from Jabberjaw to Captain Caveman and other uh, wonderful things that uh, we have, strangely, we have fond memories of. And these days, kids look at those things and say, you actually watch that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> they do, they do. So those that sounds like the 60s and the 70s. Scooby-Doo kind of era, and the 80s were a step up, how? Well, things still uh, weren't so great in the 80s. Interestingly enough, one of the uh, changes came in the increase in commercialism when all of those toy cartoons of the 80s came out, uh, you know, with G.I. Joe, Transformers, GoBots, and other fun stuff like that. Though, also in the 80s, the one thing that changed was uh, syndication, where actually I believe it was Disney of all the studios that first took that risk. The idea, of course, is that if you could produce an entire season of uh, cartoons and uh, then uh, rerun it for uh, many, many times, mm -hmm. uh, you could essentially get your money back by uh, actually 
putting more of a budget toward and you know story and animation and as a result even though it's a little hard to believe these days DuckTales really was uh, something of a uh, landmark as far as TV animation was concerned and why is that for that reason it actually had some uh, decent stories as opposed to the you know and the animation was far far better than what we were getting from uh, Hanna-Barbera and so you know we've got the uh, Disney ones like DuckTales and Tailspin and uh, Darkwing Duck and and even today anime fans uh, fondly remember Disney's Gargoyles (laughs) did you know that they're rebooting DuckTales I'm not surprised at all (laughs) And then at the same time, of course, Disney also scored with Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which in, which uh, helped uh, propel the animation renaissance of the big screen. Uh, the real breakout there, besides Roger Rabbit, was The Little Mermaid. Oh, yes. And then for a brief period of time, maybe about five years or so, Disney had its own renaissance, as we got Aladdin, we got Beauty and the Beast, we got The Lion King. Though, unfortunately, they started to stagnate in a way as well, although that had a lot to do with with the studio politics. The studio politics, and they t- turned to their Florida studio and said, do whatever you want, and we got the Disney weird period with, with films like like Lilo and Stitch, <laughs> and so, I'm trying to think of some of the other weird ones, but The Emperor's New Groove <laughs> and Atlantis, and I wish that they would bring those back. <laughs> Though that's because there was yet another, well, there were a lot of revolutions taking place, and they really can be called revolutions. One, of course, was the CGI uh, computer animation revolution, of which uh, we found Pixar Mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of other studios as well. I mean, Pixar, of course, suddenly started uh, having one incredible hit after another to the point where Disney decided it would be more cost efficient to just buy out Pixar completely. And at the same time, CGI animation, you could almost say it shattered the barrier between uh, animation and special effects. It certainly did. Because up until that point, those two industries were really separate. Uh, And then, of course, during the 90s, it came together with things like Mm -hmm. Jurassic Park, Terminator 2, and even Titanic. I mean, considering that just about every frame in Titanic was enhanced with CGI. Not every frame, but a lot of the uh, iceberg scenes. Have you ever seen Treasure Planet? Unfortunately, I did miss that one. Treasure Planet, I can't remember if it was Disney or not. It was one of those movies that was made just on the cusp of traditional animation and computer animation. And so all of the characters were hand-drawn, but all of the backgrounds were CGI. What I remember is that Treasure Planet, I believe, some said was Disney's attempt to remake Hayao Miyazaki's Laputa, Castle in the Sky. Certainly might be. Studio Ghibli in space, I guess. (laughs) Well, that's actually uh, something else to bring up, of course. I mean, anime fans in particular will pretty much beat you over the head with the uh, point that animation really made inroads into uh, TV uh, starting in the 80s when we had things like Robotech and Force 5 and Star Blazers. And then, of course, it moved on when we uh, started seeing things like Studio Ghibli, which, again, ended up working with Disney. And, and of course, all of these anime uh, series that have since become so mainstream, we now see them regularly on uh, Cartoon Network. You know what? We did talk about the, uh, the influence of anime on Western cartoons. We talked about how in anime there tends to be an overall arc to the series, whereas in Western animation that's a fairly new thing, but it's what people want. Uh, I could certainly agree with that. I mean, the the influence of uh, anime as far as as far as actual storytelling, episodic storytelling in uh, TV animation is uh, fairly new within the last couple of decades or so. I would also uh, suggest that it's not entirely based on anime, but also the uh, popularity of modern science fiction TV as well, which I think really stems from Babylon 5, in that Star Trek The Next Generation was really episodic. It did have a slow-moving plot, yes, but you could still syndicate those episodes pretty much every... uh, which way you want. But Babylon 5 really had a uh, five-season storyline. An overall arc to it. Yes. And every character had a back door in case they needed to kick someone out. Yes. And they actually, you know, had to use it for at least one character. And that also happened to be, again, during the midst of the CGI uh, special effects revolution. 
Oh, yeah. They, I think they were one of the first sci-fi television shows to use CGI. Like, prior to that, it was all model building. I would say, actually, Star Trek The Next Generation probably beat them by that. They certainly had a model for the main ship, whereas Babylon 5, the entire space station, was animated. Oh, there is that, yes. I mean, I certainly won't disagree with it. Though, I'm saying as well that I think Babylon 5 influence, along with anime, because, as you know, most of these writers here, they were very familiar with both of them, American sci-fi and especially these days anime and manga, uh, it all combined to help the uh, storylines we see today. And that's what leads into modern animation. Are you aware of the Babylon 5 teddy bear story? No, I missed this one. Okay, on Babylon 5 there was one episode where John Sheridan runs into a teddy bear that has the initials JS right on it, and he doesn't like cute things so he shoved it out the airlock. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole thing with, with, with him. It was a little, little side note to the story. At the same time, there was another show on television, it, Space Cases. It was a kid's sci-fi show, and it was run by Peter David and Bill Mumy, who were both working on Babylon 5. So they took the bear, the exact same teddy bear, and put it onto their show, where a character finds it floating in space, and have one of the characters say, what kind of dope would throw a perfectly good bear into space? Now I have to track that episode down on YouTube any way I can. Oh, yes. And um, at, at the end of the episode, it turns out that it was thrown into space by an evil race called the Strazin. <laughs> that being a play on J. Michael Straczynski, who wrote that episode and most episodes of Babylon 5. <laughs> who, while aggressive, were not very rich. <laughs> Sticking with uh, animation, I suppose, it's also around that time, again, CGI animation and cartoons also uh, made some leaps and bounds, and I still feel it was influenced by Babylon 5. At that time, there were a couple of uh, CGI series that were, definitely had some adult themes when we're talking about Roughnecks based on uh, Starship Troopers, and there was even this strange uh, CGI series called War Planets. I'm not sure I don't how many people that might one. remember that. I think I, I may have been a little young for that one at the time. It seemed as though for a while uh, CGI on TV was again going by leaps and bounds and that every season there would be a new series with that as far as the animation was concerned it was like heads and tails over the last when we talk about reboot the one that takes place in the uh, computer world and then we went on to as I said war planets and there was even a CGI Transformers series okay, yeah. uh, Beast Wars which, interestingly enough, was not just a uh, toy commercial. It had a uh, pretty, it definitely had some sly I'm trying to think of how to tie all this adults. together with the cartoons, and I'm thinking, we, we have cartoons on TV right now that are currently entirely CGI. They're not hand-drawn at all. Here's a suggestion. Uh, in the midst of all this, there's yet another uh, wave that came in, that is there's internet that, flash yeah. animation. Yeah, I mean, it started out, well, of course, on the internet, where a few cartoons became real breakouts, and the prime example of South this, Park. of course, is South Park. However, flash animation is both is uh, especially so inexpensive to create, and yet it's relatively high quality animation. It's uh, quickly been adopted, and just about every uh, modern day cartoon now, while they do still have some have fancy CGI, a lot of it is done in flash. And we're thinking of stuff like uh, Powerpuff Girls, or moving on to uh, your favorite uh, series Steven of Universe. today, Steven Universe. <laughs> Actually, Steven Universe is not Flash. It's uh, hand-drawn. Every frame is hand-drawn in Korea. I'll stand corrected in that case. I'm, I'm thinking things like Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. That okay. definitely was well, uh, Flash. Well, we've been talking for about 15 minutes now. I think we've got... I think we should wrap this up. Do you have any final thoughts? All right. Well, only that... I'm really pretty much looking forward to seeing what's next in that while uh, Pixar is still dominating the uh, film scene, there are some other uh, studios that do seem to be uh, coming up. I mean, DreamWorks has done uh, its best to try to follow in Pixar's footsteps, and I'm so uh, who knows what will happen next. Too. All right, thank you very much for joining me once again. All right, well, thank you once again. Thanks for listening to the Art and Oddities podcast with A.M. Hall. That's our show for today. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please go through the grueling task of leaving us a review on whatever platform you're using to listen. I have a new and improved URL to the iTunes page. It's tiny.cc slash amhall. Or just Google Art and Oddities Podcast for the player of your choice. The production and editing of this podcast has been provided by Reverend Panic Evelyn Bedlam, and without her, it would not exist. Panic and I are looking to get some better quality microphones and make the entire podcast just sound all around better, but we can't do it without your help. You can help us do that by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash panicbedlam. That's P-A-N-I-K-B-E-D-L-A-M. Evie has also done me the honor of designing some t-shirts for the podcast. Just search for Panic Bedlam on redbubble.com. Links to the Redbubble page will be available in the show notes. Our theme music, Doxel Dance in Space Time, or Belial and His Seven Wives, was composed and performed by Kion Huru Orion, or as I know him, Michael. Thanks, Michael. If you would like to contact the show with comments or suggestions, you can email us at artoddiespodcast at gmail.com, or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash oddartpodcast. Next episode, I'll finally be talking with Nyx Eradicatus, who's been mentioned on this show since the very first episode about her experience playing the Muse Erato in the film we've been making, The Trial of Hephaestus. That about wraps it up. Remember, the highest form of magic is doing, and expressing yourself is art. This is A.M. Hall, signing off. <laughs>